Hello everyone, this is Professor Paul. This is part three, final lecture in the introductory What is Literature series, looking at some basic fundamental questions about literature. So let's go on to part three. So this is called modes and features. And by modes, I mean the, the format of a literary work. Some people will use the term genres, um, but I prefer the term modes. And what are the characteristics of those modes or genres of literature? So the different modes, again, like we've talked about novel, short story, poem, play, comic book, etc. Some people, like I said, you will use the term genre, although I prefer to use the term genre to talk about things like the detective genre or the science fiction genre or the romance genre. And so you can have a short story or a play or a novel, and they're all in the detective genre, but they're different modes of literature. That's the way I use it, at least. Let's look at the fundamental elements, the basic elements of all literature. Any work of literature is going to have a character, is going to have characters, and that's one of the most important elements. The people who take part in the events of the story. And again, the people, the characters are not necessarily human. In poetry, we often talk about the speaker rather than character, the person that's speaking the, po the poem, and the audience or the addressee, the person being spoken to. That's the other sort of implicit character in a poem. So we use slightly different terms, but it's the same essential concept. Who is in the story? Who is this about? Who is doing what we see? And what we see is the plot. That's the events that occur within a story in the order that they're told. What's the arrangement of events in a story? So plot, for example, could be like the plotting that I mentioned in, in the last lecture, a story where the scenes are told in reverse. So what happens in the story? What are the events? In poetry, again, a little bit different. Po in poetry, plot is often not as obvious. Whereas, of course, in a movie, you see, oh, well, Tony Stark gets kidnapped, he invents the Iron Man suit, he escapes, he becomes Iron Man, blah, blah, blah. Very clear series of events. In poetry, it's often much more difficult to find an explicit series of events like that. So the plot is often implied or even a figurative plot, a sort of imagined series of events rather than a real series of events. Of course, there's also setting. If there's something happening, it has to be happening somewhere and some when. So where is this story taking place? And that could be as specific as the very room in which it's taking place, or we can also think about the country, the type of landscape. Is it a warm landscape? Is it a cold landscape? Is it snowy? Is it rainy? Is it foggy? Is it in the north? Is it in the south? Is it in a city? Is it in the, the forest? Is it in the jungle? All these sorts of things. Um, is it in an office building? Is it in a rural shack? Is it in a bathroom? Is it in a phone booth? And the time of the story is part of the setting. Is it in the far future? Is it today? Is it in the medieval period? Um, so setting is important for us to understand how these things are happening and where. And again, in poetry, setting is often much more figurative or implied or not necessarily even explicitly stated. Just these are someone speaking, something is happening, but the setting is sort of vague or even just in the mind, in the imagination of the speaker. Figurative language. All works of literature and most of us in our everyday speaking use figurative language. That is words that are used to imply meanings that go beyond the literal meanings. When we say something and we don't mean what we say, we mean something else besides what we say. And this is going to be most noticeable in poetry, but it's an essential part of all literary works. There's the narrator, and this is most important in short story and, and novels. The narrator is the voice or the person, who, and again, not necessarily human, who's telling the story. In films, we might sometimes have a voiceover that could be the narrator. In drama, though, in plays, there's rarely a narrator. Sometimes a character might also serve as the narrator, might step out, but there's really an objective voice like there is sometimes in novels or stories, a bird's eye view telling the story. 
in poetry, the speaker is basically the narrator, is the person telling the story, because the speaker is the only voice that we have. And one of the most obscure concepts when we talk about literature as an essential element is theme, what we mean by theme. Um, and theme is a very vague and very problematic concept, but it's sort of essential at the same time. What's the idea or ideas that the story represents or implies or communicates? And this can be as specific as um, the meaning of life is finding your true loved one, or it can be more vague as well. The theme of this story is death and it's exploring death. Um, when we talk about it, we want to be as precise as possible. How is it representing this idea? What is it communicating to us about the experience of or the human understanding of something like love, death, freedom, et cetera, et cetera? So let's talk about the modes of literature or the genres of literature. First is poetry. And I'm starting with poetry because it's really, it dates to the earliest stages of human civilization and human experience. Um, as far back as there have been humans, it seems there's been something like poetry. And it's very intimately related to music. Perhaps poetry emerged from music, from song. It's also related, I think, to religion or what became religion, to myth, to prayer, to ritual. Uh, so poetry is part of a fundamental way that humans, since the humans first evolved, have tried to express themselves, in particular express their connection to higher ideas and higher purposes. As we talked about in the last lecture, poetry generally can be identified by its layout on the page because it's usually written in verse. So here's that same Derek Walcott ex uh, excerpt. The top is as it's originally presented in verse. The bottom is what it would look like if it were in prose, where there's no attention to the rhythm or no explicit attention to the quantity of syllables and stresses in the line. It just goes by the layout of the page. So you can see the difference between verse and prose. And normally when we think about poetry, we think about what's called lyric poetry. There are other kinds of poetry, like narrative poetry. But normally what we think about and what we're going to be reading for the most part in this class is lyric poetry. That's something that, that we imagine as being spoken by a character or a persona. So it's sort of like a speech or a, a monologue in a play. And it's addressed to a fictional or imagined audience. And that could be one person or it could be multiple people. And lyric poetry, there's some context, situation, or relationship, or intention. Because again, it's almost like a, a little scene, a little dramatic scene, one person talking to another. So they have some idea that they're expressing. There's some situation that makes them speak, but there's often not an obvious plot or narrative. Again, as we talked about, it's more about the emotional human experience which is one of the things that made poetry so beautiful, but also so challenging. So when speaking about specific elements of poetry, the speaker, this is like character. The character in poetry is we normally talk about the speaker. Who is the person that's expressing themselves in words? And it's a fictional person, not necessarily the actual author. It could be a, a, an imagined persona, an imagined version of themselves, or they could be taking on a character, much like an actor does, and is expressing the ideas of that actor or that character. So that's who's speaking the poem. And they're speaking to an addressee or audience or listener. The person here on the right that the arrow is pointing to, that all the noise, all the words, all the ideas are going from the mouth of one into the ear of the other. So the addressee is the fictional person who hears the poem, the person that the speaker is speaking to. And that's not us, that's not you, the reader, although it might be some imagined version of you. Poetry, as we said before, is written usually in verse. And that's language that is quantified and measured 
For example, it's organized into syllables and stresses. And as we see here, you might have seen this before. You might have learned how to do this, how to scan a poem for its stresses and syllables. And it's organized in a particular pattern, and that's called the meter. And it's also divided into stanzas or groups of lines. So you might have a certain meter that governs how long the lines are and a, a grouping of stanzas. So that's the number of lines of that meter in a particular verse paragraph, we might say. And another very important part of poetry are the sonic devices. All the elements such as rhyme, alliteration, assonance, we'll go over these later in the semester when we, when we get to poetry, that create the musical effects that make poetry sound beautiful and feel pleasurable to speak and hear. To talk a little bit about um, how to write about poetry, so this is some practical stuff. When you are citing poetry in any assignments for this class or any others, um, titles for poems are usually almost always placed in quotations. Um, so The River Merchant's Wife, A Letter, Silhouette, those are the titles of two poems that we're going to be reading this semester. If you were writing about them, you would put their titles in quotation marks. There are very long poems. There are book length poems, 50, 75 pages plus. And when you're talking about a long poem like that, that's published in its own book form, you normally will italicize the titles. So Paradise Lost, The Wasteland, those are long book length poems. So they are italicized in the way that a book title is also italicized. When you're citing a poem, you cite the by line number in parentheses. So here's two examples. This is a quote from a poem by Ezra Pound, and I'm quoting part of the first line. So I put the number one in parentheses, indicating that it's from line one. If you're quoting more than one line, if you're quoting two or three lines, then you would put them just in the text the way I did there, but you didn't include a slash in between the lines. And if you're quoting a large chunk of poetry, four lines or more, you put it in a block quote and you try to reproduce it as closely as is printed in terms of spacing and indentation and things like that. So that's just some practical matters when it comes to writing about poetry. Let's look at the next mode of literature, drama or plays. And I, we go into them second because they're almost as ancient as poetry. Um, drama is very intimately related to poetry as a form. In some sense, drama is just poetry that has become more elaborate from being one person speaking a poem to being a group of people as a chorus speaking a poem to ultimately being an actor that steps out from the chorus and takes their own role to then multiple actors. That's how it seems drama evolved in ancient Greece. And drama is also intimately related to religious and civic rituals. Again, like poetry as a form of prayer and a form of community, a form of people getting together to communicate and celebrate and uh, engage in various, again, civic, political, and religious rituals together. So drama is written for usually live performance. Um, for one or more actors, plus an audience, obviously an audience to watch the actors. Classical drama, so that's thinking about ancient Greece, ancient Rome, up through the Middle Ages, up into the Renaissance, was written mostly in verse, or was written entirely in verse, rather. And it wasn't until around 1500, so only about 500 years ago, that people started using prose as well as verse in drama. And modern drama is now mostly prose because that seems more natural to us but and more realistic. But in classical culture, poetry, they appreciated the artisticness, the artistic nature of poetic verse and poetic drama in a way that we just don't anymore. Here's an example, two examples of verse and prose drama, both from the same play. So Shakespeare, who's writing in uh, the 1590s here, Midsummer Night's Dream, he uses both prose and verse in his plays. So here we have an example on the left of verse and on the right from prose. On the left, it's uh, one of the young lovers, one of the high class characters speaking in verse. 
on the right, its bottom, one of the foolish, low-class characters speaking in prose. Now, when you read a play, what do you see? Well, you pretty much all you see is dialogue. That's it. Just the dialogue between the characters, what they are saying. There will be some stage directions. For example, the set might be described. It might say, this takes place within a room. There's a chair in the corner. There's a clock on the wall. There's a dead body lying on the floor, whatever it might be. It might describe particular props. There might be some description of the characters. Such and such is a gloomy person. Such and such is very strict. Another character might be described as flighty or, or, or daydreaming, whatever. Um, and there might be some description of action. So it might say at this point, such and such leaves, exits the stage or enters the stage or gets up or here we have a sword fight, whatever it might be. So there's a limited amount of description, but it's pretty much just dialogue. And for the most part, a lot of the stuff that you see in a play script is printed there primarily for the readers, not for the actors or the director who make their own decisions about a lot of those things. In ancient drama, it was often really just continuous action. One thing happened, then another thing happened, then another thing happened. Characters are pretty much entering and leaving, no stop. When we get into the classical drama of Europe in the Middle Ages and Renaissance, then we get into slightly more formalized uh, structure. And so rather than just a kind of continuous one scene, we get a series of scenes. Um, again, often very rapidly switched from one to another, but rather than it being all one place and one time, um, we can jump around to different places and different times. And these scenes were often grouped into acts, and four or five acts being the most common. And today in modern drama, we usually go by the act and scene uh, uh, structure, and most modern plays are usually one to three acts rather than five acts. Um, the one to three act structure has become the most common, and again, each act is a group of related scenes. So let's look at those terms again. A scene is continuous action in one place or time, and so when we think about the ancient drama of the Greeks, it all happened in one place, and it all happened in real time. So that's why the scene was continuous. But when we get to medieval and Renaissance drama, we can have multiple places. They start using multiple places and different time periods. So something, the action could unfold over a longer period of time. So we have distinctions between scenes. And then the acts, again, are a group of scenes. So it's one segment of the story. The three act structure conforms sort of very nicely to beginning, middle, middle end with the climax being roughly around the end of the second act. Now let's turn to our third, slash third and fourth uh, mode of literature, and that's prose fiction. And this includes both novels and short stories. So what's a novel? Well, novels are longer narratives, longer stories. They just have more words, more pages. And for the most part, it usually takes multiple sittings to complete a novel. Now, of course, many people have sat down with a novel and been so enthralled that they spent all night reading it. I know may, many of you might have done that with, for example, a Harry Potter novel, something like that. I've done it before. But for the most part, it takes multiple sittings to complete a novel. And a novel could be 100 pages. It could be 1,000 pages or more. There are some very, very long novels out there. So long stories written, again, usually in prose. Now, novels are much more recent when we compare them to poetry and drama. Novels really emerge around 1600, only around 400 years ago. And it was kind of a new kind of storytelling. And it was a departure from the old kinds of chivalric romance, the stories of knights and ladies in distress. Instead, novels started to turn the focus more towards real people and more realistic settings. Although, of course, again, we have genre fiction like science fiction and fantasy, which is very unrealistic. But the focus on individuals, individual experience, individual psychology, that's one of the hallmarks of the novel. And often the first novel uh, was considered to be Don Quixote by Miguel de Cervantes. Um, 
the famous Spanish author, published in 1605. Short stories, as the name tells us, are shorter. They're shorter than novels. So short stories are compared to novels. Um, they usually you can read them in one sitting, although sometimes there are some that might take multiple sittings. And they're a variable length, but generally we're talking about under 80 pages and usually even shorter than that, under 40 pages. So short stories are much shorter. As a form, as a mode or genre, they don't emerge until the late 1700s. So they're the most recent of these uh, standard traditional forms of literature. Short stories are often much more limited in scope and complexity than a novel. You just can't write as much, you can't write about as much in 20 pages as you can in 200. But these brief stories, these short stories are often very intense. That's one of the things that the short story has. It can be very compressed in its, um, in its depiction of a narrative. And sometimes short stories take the forms of snapshots or sketches or portraits. Um, and notice these are all visual terms used to talk about what short stories can do. They give us a, just a very brief picture of a period of time or a portrait of a character, a person, describe a person. So these are some of the things that short stories often do and how they're different from novels. Now, there are also some other forms of prose fiction. There's the novella, which is somewhere in between a novel and a short story. So 80 pages, 75 pages, 100 pages, maybe that's a novella. There's no real set definition here, but something that's a little bit shorter than a novel, a little bit longer than a short story. And then we also have the things that are called short, short stories or flash fiction. These are very, very short, 500 words or less sometimes. And although some of you may be saying, wow, I'd really rather read a 500 word or less story rather than a 20 page story, um, they're often way more difficult to understand in a certain sense because they're just so compressed in the way that poetry is often very difficult to talk about because it's so compressed. So to cite short stories, short story titles are in quotation marks. So one of the stories we'll be reading, for example, is called The Werewolf. So you'd put that in quotation marks. Novel titles are in italics like long poems. So Brave New World, the novel that we'll be reading is in italics. Plays are also in italics. I didn't put that in the lecture, but uh, a play would be, the title would be in italics. So I want to give just a final note about something that's, well, it's a little bit of a pet peeve of mine, but it's important. And um, it's important to all English professors and anyone who cares about, really about being accurate in the words we use. Novel is not a synonym for book. Just because something is in a book, that doesn't mean it's a novel. People often, students often will use novel for things that aren't novels. A novel is a type of fiction, fictional narrative. It's a type of story. Whereas a book is a physical object. It's a bound collection of pages upon which texts are printed. Okay, so what do I mean? What, what, why am I making a big deal about this difference? Let's look at this. All novels are books because all novels are printed in books, unless it's an ebook, for example. But not all books are novels. For example, your textbook isn't a novel, right? Uh, your, your history book isn't a novel. A cookbook isn't a novel. And also a play that is published in a book is not a novel. So something written by Shakespeare, published in a book, printed in a book, is not a novel. Shakespeare wrote plays, like The Tempest, which we'll be reading this semester, and Shakespeare's plays were printed in books, but Shakespeare did not write novels, and he did not write books. He wrote plays. And just to confuse you a little bit more, Brave New World, it's a book and it is a novel. The Tempest is a play and it's printed in a book, but it is not a book, nor is it a novel. <laughs> I know this might seem a little confusing and maybe I'm being 
seeming a little pedantic or, or overly strict about this, but it really does make a difference. You might not see it at first, but it really does make a difference. And again, short stories and poems are printed in books. You'll have a book that's a collection of poetry, but those books aren't novels. A collection of poetry is a collection of poetry. A collection of short stories is a collection of short stories. And you wouldn't call a short story a novel or a poem a novel, even though they're printed in books. And you wouldn't call either of them a book. So the point here is just to be careful about your terminology. Because they are different things. A play does something different than a novel. Someone who writes a play is trying to do something different than someone who writes a novel. And if you don't know the difference between them, or if you use the, the terms interchangeably, then it shows that you don't really understand what you're talking about. So make sure you're careful when you use your terms. All right, that's the last of the videos on what is literature the introductory uh, series. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me via email or text um, or phone call. Um, otherwise, I look forward to working with you and seeing what you have to say in class. Um, and I will see you next week on our next set of lectures.